Hello and welcome to our program this evening. I'm Stephanie Gaspar, President of Kissimmee Valley Audubon Society, and appreciate everyone watching. I want to give a special thanks to Dr. Eunice Laurent for joining us last month for her literature review on how birds have responded to various human behaviors and environments. If you haven't seen the program yet, be sure to check it out on our YouTube channel. I have a few chapter announcements. We will not have a field trip or general meeting next month, but we'll resume again in January. We may also begin face-to-face -face meetings in the spring, so stay tuned for details. Additionally, if you haven't signed up for the North Shore Birding Festival already, please do so. It will take place from December 2nd through 6th at Lake Apopka and is sponsored by Orange Audubon. Deborah can give more details during her presentation. Before we begin, I would like to mention a few housekeeping items. Log into YouTube and type any questions you have in the chat. Questions can be answered at the end of the presentation. I'm happy to introduce tonight's guest, Deborah Green, president of Orange Audubon Society. Deborah is a former entomologist and avid promoter of plants for caterpillars and birds and supports the work of Dr. Doug Tallamy. She first became interested in native plants in the 1970s while a student at the University of California, Berkeley, and was a member of the California Native Plant Society. After earning her PhD in entomology, she worked six years as an entomologist before becoming a science teacher and professor of environmental science in Central Florida. Retiring from Valencia College seven years ago, Deborah serves as the president of Orange Audubon Society. Having joined Florida Native Plant Society in the late 80s, she is working to make her home landscape in Longwood nearly 100% native. She loves to share what has worked and what hasn't and what to plant to increase habitat for birds. As for the program tonight, the caterpillar, caterpillar connection, many folks hate the thought of insects eating the plants in their gardens. Tonight, Deborah will explain why having plenty of caterpillars in your garden can be a good thing. She will also talk about why Florida native plants are the best for the insects and therefore for having lots of birds in your yard. And she will provide tips for success as well. Thank you very much for joining us this evening, Deborah, and I will now pass it over to you. Thank you, Stephanie. Appreciate the introduction, appreciate the invite. Okay, welcome everybody. This is a favorite topic of mine, plants for birds, uh, the caterpillar connection. And I, I could just pose the question, why are we into native plants? Everybody probably has a different reason, um, but in my uh, years, uh, my, my studies and years of work, I had several periods of, of interest for different reasons. When I was an entomologist, it was because native plants would not need pesticides. They have their insects on them, but they would not be out of control insects. So that was early phase of my interest in native plants. And then I had a chance to work for nine years in Volusia County in the water conservation for some utilities in Volusia. And so the, a reason for planting natives is, is if you put the right plant in the right place, you'll need water only for establishment. For instance, this is part of my landscape uh, with the dune sunflower, the uh, bee balm, the gallardia, and the silver palmetto. And I don't water it unless, um, well, after establishment, I don't water it. But now my interest in natives is for the birds because birds are in trouble. You've seen this report that 2.9 billion birds were, were down that number in 50 years. This is based on a combination of ornithological research and citizen science. So here we go. Plants for birds, a con caterpillar connection. Well, those of you who are birders know that fall and spring migration are exciting times of year. This is um, Orange Audubon's field trip at Mead Botanic Gardens, uh, probably a spring field trip. We do it spring and fall. This is before COVID, so we used to have big groups. Um, and we're looking up and for warblers. Warblers are gorgeous little songbirds 
and there are 37 species of the eastern United States. Most of these just pass through Florida going north or south to the tropics. Um, Frank Salmon took these beautiful pictures. He was one of the people who participated in those walks over the years and caught the bug for warblers. And our warblers are thought to be originally tropical. And what's the reason for that? Well, two thirds of the species of warblers live in the tropics. Uh, excuse me, that's, that's not what I meant to say. Uh, a, a lot of species live in the tropics and our, our species live two thirds of the year in the tropics. Um, like this mangrove wall, warbler, we, we call it, um, it will exist next to uh, the yellow warbler and some of our warblers in the winter when they go down there. So the annual migration from the tropics to Eastern North America is dangerous as well as the one south. These are dangerous things to do to fly so far. Predators, weather, other hazards. So why do they do it? Well, first of all, some species live in the Caribbean, many species, and they, they don't have that far to go. It's not that bad. Some, these are some of the Caribbean species and familiar ones to us, the hooded, magnolia, red star, yellow rumped, chestnut sided, Northern Parallel, the yellow warbler, worm eating, Blackburnian. Whereas some of these may also have other locations. A lot of they do live in the Caribbean and have just a short hip hop. The black throated blue is another one. But those that live farther south in, in Central America, Central America or South America, they have a long way to go. What is their route? It could be across the Gulf, Trans Gulf or it could be up through the desert. And the majority cross the Gulf. For some reason, that is a better option. The desert's pretty, um, pretty difficult. The trans-Gulf migra migrants, they hit, when they hit storms, they fall on oil rigs or ships or right into the water. They, there used to be or an ornithologist on one of the oil rigs who was monitoring the birds um, getting caught on the oil, oil rig. Crossing the desert, you're crossing the largest desert in North America, the Chihuahuan Desert, and uh, it's pretty tough. And what's the reward for the risks of these dangerous semi-annual flights? Caterpillars, little soft-bodied caterpillars. I'm not talking big butterfly caterpillars, I'm talking little ones about a half inch at, at most. They start even smaller. They're soft bodied and they're perfect food for nestlings, for a warbler to feed their nestlings. They have exoskeletons like all insects, but they are not hardened, like let's visualize a beetle with a hardened exoskeleton. They, they do not go through that process of hardening the exoskeleton. And they're easy for a warbler to pick out and stuff them down the nestling's gullet. They're also rich in carotenoids. This is something pointed out by Doug Tallamy I'll be talking about in a second. And they, this may be actually the source of some of the bright colors of the warblers, the carotenoids. So songbird migration is timed with the spring leafing out of the deciduous forests. And how do I know this? I read this book more than once, Living on the Wind Across the Hemisphere with Migratory Birds by Scott Widensall. That is a book that um, was a Pulitzer Prize finalist in 2000. And I don't think there's another bird book that has gotten that far in recognition to a general public. It's a beautifully written book. Now he has a new book and um, a new book on migration, pointing out all the new things going on, um, new research tools. And Arne Jadabon is actually gonna have him in January. You all can tune in as well. I think it's um, third Thursday in January, Scott Widensall. 
But that's how I know, because I read this book, he explains this whole thing of the, the coordination with the east, the leafing out of the eastern forest and the migration. Now, the, the caterpillars hatching out, I should tell you the cycle of the, the adults of the caterpillars are moths, and they may overwinter. There, there's four stages. Of, there's the egg, larvae, pupae, and adult. Any of these stages could overwinter. The toughest stage is the pupae. So very frequently, um, the caterpillar will um, molt to the pupal stage for the winter and then come out the adult and the adult quickly lays the eggs on the, on the right habitat. So the caterpillar hatch is timed with emergence of new leaves of deciduous tree. And not only deciduous trees have new leaves, conifers have new leaves too, and caterpillars too. So to review what I've been talking about, warblers and other songbirds need caterpillars to feed their young. And they also need them in migration or can use them in migration. This is a black and white warbler at Fort DeSoto Park that our friend Sam Mitchum took a picture of. So that wasn't for feeding their young, it was for sustenance during migration. But generally, and everybody knows this idea that it's the berries that sustain birds in migration. And that's why you wanna have a lot of buried plants in your yard. But as I'm gonna propose, you also need plants that foster caterpillars for the birds, for the, excuse me, caterpillars for the birds. Well, 2.9 billion birds gone in 50 years. Why? I wrote an op-ed, reducing lawns, adding native plants could help dwindling bird populations. And I went through the different groups of birds, the grassland birds, the shorebirds, based on the research, why they are, doing so poorly. But the one that we can help the most ourselves is the, one, the, the forest birds by planting native trees and shrubs because the forests are decreasing. Um, when the uh, European settlers came to North America in the 1600s, they brought the tools to cut the forests and they did. And the for deforestation continues. Right now in Mato Grosso, um, they also have, in addition to cutting them, they have fires. Fires uh, induced, made worse by climate change. So what can you do to help songbirds? Plant the best trees for caterpillars in addition to trees and shrubs with berries. Learn to live with caterpillar damage on your plants. Use no pesticides and reduce your lawn and change the palette of plants in your yard to plants that foster caterpillars, the native plants of your area. And Doug Tallamy's work has popularized this concept and, and really put between D Scott Widensall's book and Tallamy's book is how I really have this so clear that I, I like to explain it to others so clearly. Um, his books are Bringing Nature Home and Nature's Best Hope, the recent one. Um, if you if you never read any Doug Tallamy, I would recommend going to Bringing Nature Home first. That was from 2007, bestseller. And um, in it, he makes the point about the caterpillar connection and that you should plant the plants that have the most caterpillars for the birds. Nature's Best Hope, this has been important to me. He says that there isn't enough habitat for birds. 41% um, of our um, North America is agriculture, not the kind of agriculture that ha provides habitat to birds, more monoculture. Um, only 5% is in pr actual preserves. 54% is in suburban or urban. So that's the part that we've got to work on and make that into better habitat. That's his homegrown national park concept. So he says, it's not enough to just grow your own native plants. You got to teach about it and get your neighbors to do it so we can make a homegrown national park. 
And this has been important to me because I was kind of shy, you know, my, I'm, I live in an HOA and you always got to fit in. So I always just pushed the envelope a little bit with, with what I was doing with my natives. And uh, now I'm out there trying to teach about it and uh, trying to create, trying to convince my neighbors, which as, as all of you know, is hard. All right, well, not only do we need to plant the plants for caterpillars, but we got to defend moths. Uh, Talami points out how to be a moth defender. You got to turn off the outdoor lights when not in use, add motion sensors to security lights, install yellow bulbs. And if all, we all did this, it would save billions of moths and other beneficial insects each year. And then the moths, of course, are the parents of the caterpillars I'm talking about. How do you identify caterpillars? Um, well, First of all, I have to admit that I'm a lazy entomologist and I don't go to my plants and look for the caterpillars and rear them out to get the adults. That's a lot of work. I know um, the place where you send them if you want to do that is the Division of Plant Industry in Gainesville. And here's our friend Julieta Brambilla um, who takes the, the uh, things that are submitted in and farms them out to the correct experts. Um, but I know I, I got discouraged. I found a cool uh, caterpillar wrapping leaves of, um, what was it? A false stinging nettle along the Wakaiva River and the, the prothonotary warblers were specifically coming down and eating that. So I wanted to know what that was. I took it home, tried to rear it out and then send it to Gainesville. But the entomologist was on vacation and anyway, it, it, it never arrived in the correct um, condition for it to be identified. So it's, it's a little rough. And, and Dr. Doug Tallamy will spout out all the different species that he finds in his yard. Well, that's his, that's what he does it, that's his feel. Um, and this is a good book if, if you wanna get that book. And one of his students provided evidence that planting native plants help birds. His student Desiree Narango did a study with the chickadees and found that they survive in yards, they don't survive in yards with less than 70% natives. So you have to have more than 70% natives to have chickadees. If, if I could see you all, I would ask you if you have chickadees in your yard. And if, if so, congratulations, you must have a lot of native plants. Um, we, we, we do in our yard. Um, and uh, we've worked at that. Um, so that's real evidence. And so how do you find out more about native plants? I know most of you are also in Native Plant Society, um, but that's the, the main source here in Florida. And National Audubon has a Plants for Birds effort and they have um, um, listings of plants for different areas. And then, each chapter can, can try to emphasize it. Plants for Birds is encouraged by National Audubon. Um, and a yards tour is an excellent means to share. Um, this is me showing off a couple of years ago. Um, it's very hard though to run a yards tour because if you're trying to find yards that have no invasives, pretty, pretty hard. <clears throat> And I want to point out that at our house, when we first moved in, it had the typical foundation plants around the windows. Um, camellias, pittosporums, viburnums. These are plants, I don't know when they were introduced, 50s or whatever, that are, were very popular. Um, but they're not good for caterpillars. They have waxy cuticles. So yeah, stuff like shiny ligustrum or... Um, Confederate jasmine, these shiny cuticles are not good. The, the, the caterpillars can't eat them. And further than that, the caterpillars are really specialists. And so the, they're specialized on different native plants, their own native plants. So Tug Talamy in Bringing Nature Home has a list, I forget what pages is, but you'll flip through and see. Um, of which ones have the most species, like the oaks um, have 534 caterpillar species that he's been able to um, collect, uh, uh, 
verify from the literature that have been reared from oaks. Next number of species are on willows and cherries um, have next and birches, which we don't have in our area and poplars, of course, he's from the North, he's from the, around Pennsylvania. So we, we got to do a little interpolation um, of his kind of list, but that's an important thing to have is a list like that. And that's what I'm going to go into now. Well, one of our Orange Audubon members, Mary Kime and her husband, Randy, um, she made a list and a, a flyer, which we now have available online and we pass out at our festivals. But let's see what large tree she recommends. And, and she got some of this from Tallamy's earlier book and uh, her own experiences. And, and she compared notes with a lot of people. Black cherry is one of the top. Cabbage palm, eastern red cedar, live oak, longleaf pine, red maple, sugarberry, winged elm. And then of course you got shrubs. Okay. So I'll go through a few of these, not too many, um, but some of the best ones, the oaks. Um, when they have new leaves, they are eaten by so many little caterpillars and you'll see the warblers and vireos and other insectivorous birds around them in, in the spring. And here we are at Mead Gardens again, and that we're probably looking up at the oaks because that's where most of the warblers are. And Doug Tallamy, his latest book is on oaks, the nature of oaks. I haven't bought it already yet, but I intend to soon. Next on Tallamy's list are the willows. And we notice that the willows here are also very good for birds and consequently must be for caterpillars. Um, like the yellow warbler seems to always be in the willows. Of course, you can't really plant willows at your house. That's not a suitable plant for most homes. But wild cherry is, that's third on the list. And um, uh, it's great. It's got these little berries that turn black and sweet and they're small enough that they're just the right size for smaller birds. And the leaves are full of caterpillars. So the warblers are gleaning the caterpillars. Um, now the only downside of Eastern red of white wild cherry or black cherry, this is Prunus serotina is the name, um, is that it gets Eastern 10 caterpillars, which are unsightly, but yellow bill cuckoos eat 10 caterpillars with their tough bills. So, I mean, who wouldn't wanna see a yellow bill cuckoo around your, your yard? That would be a thrill. <clears throat> Now, one that we people who bird on the Lake Apopka Wildlife Drive really love is the sugarberry. Right inside the gate on the left and the right, those trees are almost all sugarberries, maybe a couple oaks on the right, but the whole row on the left is sugarberries. And um, there's also hackberry is the species a little farther north. Well, I put in my first sugarberry at my house because I wanted to attract the hackberry emperor or the tawny emperor, two beautiful butterflies that breed on it. And I have yet to see those guys, but I did start to notice that warblers were um, around the, the sugar berries. So there must've been lots of caterpillars and I do see da caterpillar damage on mine. Um, and they, the berries are just the right size. They're just a little sweet dry berry that warblers can eat. Um, Cedar waxwings can eat, blue grosbeaks can eat. And um, <clears throat> when I presented for your pine lily chapter, uh, Karina, I asked her, uh, if she's a landscape architect, if uh, she promoted sugarberry and she said, yes. And we don't understand why it's not sold in a native nursery more. Um, it's just one of those unappreciated trees. It grows pretty fast and gets big. So um, anyway, if you wanna bring birds to your yard, try a sugarberry. And then of course you can't forget the, our state tree, the sable palm. And one of this cool insect associations and bird associations is that the sable palm has this palm leaf skeletonizer that makes all this 
frass. Frass is, is insect excrement. It's, and the yellow-throated warbler is kind of a specialist. If you think about it, isn't that a place where you've seen yellow-throated warblers before on palms? Well, that's this is the connection. And here I have a picture of the adult of the uh, palm leaf skeletonizer. And you see that it's a very small, little, delicate, little moth. The caterpillar is small. So we're talking, and the term for these kind of small caterpillars is microlepidoptera. By the way, the sable palm fruits are sweet and they're good for birds as well. Uh, the robins particularly like them, but cedar waxwings as well. Now, I, most, many of you do butterfly gardening. Well, the butterflies are not optimal for birds. Maybe a big bird like a blue jay, but not warblers. So uh, I'm suggesting that you shift your thinking less on the, cat, on the butterfly piece and go toward these caterpillars that are good for the warblers. So what are the best trees for caterpillars in Central Florida? Reviewing what I've said, oaks, cherries, like the wild cherry, Pruna serotina, wild cherry or black cherry. And by the way, we don't like the um, cherry laurel. It's, although native, it's very aggressive and in that sense invasive. So focus, don't ever buy one of those. Uh, and if you have them, try to try to keep them in control. Um, but you could try to buy a, a black cherry, Prunus serotina. And then, as I mentioned, sugar, sugarberry. Um, that's I, 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 more recently I figured out that sugarberry is the name for the one in the south, and farther north it's called the hackberry. Okay, and then of course your state tree, the sable palm. It, it pains me to see all the exotic palms being planted around when they, people could be planting beautiful sable palms. And where to buy native plants? Not here, not at just any old fruit stand that might have them cheap. The ones that are cheap are going to be ones that are easy to propagate very fast to the point that they might be invasive. And they are not the right species. Like these have waxy cuticles that they're, they're not conducive and they're not native, so they're not conducive to the caterpillars. Uh, the very good source for information is Florida Association of Native Nurseries. You can actually put in a plant or a location, get the nurseries. It's excellent. They've really made up an, a rich resource on their website now. And whenever there's a local sale, uh, I, I know you used, you used to have um, sales with Pine Miller chapter and hopefully you will again, um, then local people in the, in the organization can share their information as they sell it. And I'm, I'm nearing the end of this. Um, that Talami, uh, he's, he's, he is a professor, so he doesn't have enough time to do outreach other than just give his, his talks around, which by the way, you can find on YouTube. Orange Audubon has a really good one on our YouTube channel um, about the Homegrown National Park. Um, but anyway, someone paired up with him to do a website and kind of a campaign thing. And the campaign is the Homegrown National Park. Get on the map. So if you have uh, a yard, let's say a half acre in Kissimmee, you can go to this um, homegrownnationalpark.org and go to your location and, and insert that you have that much that you're putting into natives. And that's the way we grow this homegrown national park. It's a great concept. All right, well, that is what I wanted to share, um, the plants for birds, a caterpillar connection, and I will entertain any questions. Hi, Deborah. <laughs> I just want to let you know, I had a big smile on my face the whole time during your presentation because I loved it. I okay. think you had excellent information, great, book recommendations and just um, I really enjoyed it and appreciated it Great. and I I do have some questions for you if you don't mind okay and 
So I was actually taking some notes down. And uh, so I'll ask little questions uh, here and there. Uh, one was a comment about the migrants traveling so far. And we always hear about, oh, the migratory birds are coming, but we don't really consider uh, some of the desert areas that they travel over. And I, to be honest, I wasn't even fully aware of that, the Chihuahuan Desert in Mexico, uh, how far that they travel. And so do you know around what time of year that the warblers, uh, that they generally come through to Florida? that people that are new to this, what time of year can they expect some of the migrants coming in? Well, that's a great question. And it has to do with the leafing out of the, tre of the deciduous trees. So that tells you it's gonna be in spring in most of the Eastern United States. So they'll be coming to Florida first and particularly the ones that are coming from the Caribbean will come quickly, um, but those that are coming to the Eastern forest, they got to wait till the thaw occurs there and they're coming up there. So April is really the best month. And uh, you know, the thing about going to Fort DeSoto Park because as they're crossing the Gulf, if they get blown off course, they go there. Yeah, that's a great place. Um, yeah, I was just, I, I can't remember exactly what I was watching or reading recently, but something said that the majority are going across the Gulf, not the Chihuahuan Desert. That's, and we're lucky the Eastern United States has this 37 species of warblers and the West has a few, but that whole corridor of Eastern forests is something they don't have in the West. So they don't have as many species. Exactly. And so uh, it just is clear that it's critical that there are food and caterpillars for them, once they cross this, uh, the Gulf or the desert, they are probably starving and looking forward to some juicy caterpillars when they arrive. Yeah, and but but the berries too um, will give them the sugar and sustain them in migration. So that's a distinction that they need the caterpillars specifically, in particular, for feeding their young to get a, a generation through. Um, and, and the, the berries can get, keep them going in migration. Excellent point. Great. All right. I have another question. So you did mention how you've been transforming your yard little by little uh, with natives. And how have your neighbors reacted to that? Have you had good input? Uh, do, are they questioning what you're doing? Have there been comments? Um, not as much as I would like either way. Uh, I mean, well, positive. Um, once uh, we are actually on the main drag of our subdivision and once in a while, somebody's walking along with their, most of them have a dog and so they're looking at that. <laughs> but if they're walking, they might see me in the yard and, and, and I always fish for compliments. I say, you like what I'm doing? <laughs> and, um, so I've, I've had some good conversations, but I don't know, it, it, it's a big step. And people moving to Florida, they, they wanna bring the plants from where they were, or they, or the, they have a vision of it that it, it's been sold to them that isn't the native. And mm -hmm. so we, we, we always have an uphill battle with this um, native thing, but oh well, um, in the meantime, if I can't convince other people, in the meantime, I can enjoy our yard and the birds. <clears throat> Absolutely. And for people that are living in a subdivision, have there been any issues with the homeowners association? Well, there are a couple cases and it, it's more a, a, a matter of the aesthetics. Um, if it looks, well, you, you got to take it slow, try to make it fit. Don't uh, go too whole, whole hog on it. Uh, so Having done that, um, I haven't had any problem with the HOA. As a matter of fact, okay, thanks to Doug Tallamy, I took an extra step. I've joined the Arbor Committee <laughs> of my HOA, which is a very nice group, actually, um, that is trying to save the trees in our subdivision uh, from newcomers who are moving in and who don't get it about the, how the, the trees enhance our subdivision. 
And, um, you know, like they want to span their driveway or something and take out a perfectly good longleaf pine. I'm really on the bandwagon to, for longleaf pines. That's a very special tree that's range has decreased so much. So, and you have it in, in Osceola, I know. So, yeah, um, it's just HO, HOA is different. There's some that are much more strict than ours. And it's sad that they would make you do stuff with your lawn, make you have a lawn that you put chemicals on. It's, it's, it's a sad thing, but um, you just inch, inch it out bit by bit. Excellent. Great. Uh, another question. I really like the slide you had that indicated chickadees. And if you have chickadees in your yard, then you have at least 70% native. And uh, I don't think a lot of people consider that of which species are attracted, uh, connected with the amount of natives. So do you know another spe uh, species of birds that requires such a high percentage of natives? Uh, that's a good question. I mean, that was just one research project that was done. I mean, you could have something in your yard for part of the year, and but the fact if, if, if it breeds, that means you need those natives and those caterpillars. No, and I, I do have a degree in entomology and my thesis was related to caterpillars, but um, I'm a lazy entomologist, as I was telling you, it, there's a lot of, it, it, yeah, so uh, I'm not, what I'm doing to learn what are the best plants is looking for the birds on the plants. And then I'm just assuming, and I, if I have a chance, I'll look at the, what caterpillars are there. And, and it's fun to see, sometimes you have cutouts in your leaves. And so then, you know, some caterpillars eating it. Um, but anyway, uh, Doug Tallamy is doing a, a, a wonderful job with that. And there are other lepidopterists around, but um, let's, an easier approach is just to look empirically for what plants attract the birds. Yes, absolutely. And I have a funny, quick story. A few years ago, I was volunteering with the Native Plant Society. It was when they were involved with the Epcot uh, Plant Festival. And so I was tabling the event and many people came over to see the native plants. There was some nice signage about uh, insects that they attract. And so many people came over and instead they asked, all of my leaves are being eaten. How do I stop that? <laughs> and so we said, no, we, you actually want that. Uh, that shows that the caterpillars and bugs are eating and that will attract birds. But I feel like uh, a lot of people just don't realize that we want that. Uh, when you see the little nibbles, this is something that should make you happy. We are attracting the caterpillars and therefore attracting birds. And it was amazing just how many people are not educated on the issue about this. And, and it, it, in a correctly balanced system, they won't wipe out a tree. Um, well, um, when I gave this talk for Orange Audubon the first time, one of my board members told about a Schumard oak that was planted that she didn't even want. And Schumard is not really native to this area, it's farther north and that it got all these caterpillars and defoliated it completely. And so that wouldn't happen in a native, uh, native tree. So you don't have to worry about that. It's just like you say, nibbles. Exactly. And all oh, right, uh, another point, and I'm really glad you mentioned this. You talked about the the leaves, those shiny, waxy leaves that yeah. are very difficult. And to be honest, I never really thought about that. And many, many years ago, I did plant Confederate jasmine. And then I found out after that, I don't think it's even really considered native, but I never see birds on it. I do see bees, but no caterpillars, no butterflies. Um, and so now I know why <laughs> it's not... Um, even available for them to eat. So I really like how you shared that point. And in addition to the waxiness, there's uh, hairiness is another defense against caterpillars. Um, and 
like when the first time I gave this talk, somebody asked about beautyberry, which is a wonderful native that has berries that are kind of survival food all, all winter for your birds. Um, is it also a good caterpillar plant? And I couldn't think of any caterpillars that I saw, nor did I really see warblers picking at the, the leaves, eating caterpillars. And then I was thinking that it, it's hairy. So that's another thing to look for. But um, so those would be more beneficial just for the berries and not necessarily a caterpillar plant. Mm. Um, that's true. And I also agree. I never see anything eating the leaves on my beauty berries. And I wonder if the, another reason for that is one of the chemical components in the leaf, which I heard repels mosquitoes. So perhaps maybe it could repel caterpillars too. Absolutely. That's where those things evolve. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Uh, Another thing, you mentioned the wild cherry with the tent caterpillars. So mm -hmm. I, I've i always heard of the tent caterpillars are terrible. You never want them in your trees. But I didn't even know how the wild cherry attracts them. But if you know you have the wild cherries with the tent caterpillars, you can attract the cuckoo. And I think that would be so fun to see. Do you know any other bird species that will eat those caterpillars. No, it's a specialist with that real strong bill. That's the only one I know of in this area. Oh, okay, and with the bill, is it to help break through that webbing or is it the, okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, 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 and I would not hold your breath on attracting a cuckoo to your yard. They are you know, very secretive and, and sequestered secretive places. But um, anyway, I thought that's a cool thing about the cat, the caterpillar. Yes, absolutely. And I, I have another comment. So my neighbor has a sugarberry tree, and I don't think she even realizes that she has it. But it's one tree, very large, and it attracts so many birds. It's right across, uh, right in her front yard. And well, so all the time I have my binoculars looking at her tree because so many birds will go there that are nowhere else. And like the cedar wax wings, I have not seen them anywhere else uh, in my neighborhood except on that tree occasionally. So I think it's a great point to mention uh, some of the berries, how they can be so useful for many, many bird species. And since you mentioned cedar wax wings, I'd like to mention the mulberries. So um, the ones that like Fort Soda Park and Mead Gardens, they have a great mulberry tree that it's a big attractant. That is not a native mulberry. Um, uh -huh. The native mulberry, the red mulberry, is not that prolific on fruit. Um, okay. So, um, you know, as a concession to not being native but attracting birds, you might want to buy a, a non-native mulberry, black mulberry. But first of all, it's going to take a lot of years before it gets big like that. And so try it with the native. One thing about mulberries is they're dioecious, male and female plants. So make sure you see some fruit before you, you would buy one. Ah, good point. And I have a lot of black swallowtails in my yard every year. And so I'm always happy when I see them, but I also have a lot of blue jays. <laughs> so I never made that connection either of just so many blue jays so many black swallowtails that mm -hmm. mm, it really makes me consider the, I'm in the process of thinking of what other native trees. I do have quite a few oaks in my yard. So I have tons of acorns and you can imagine squirrels and then all other uh, warblers and things like that. So I'm happy to attract them. But I think it's really important to, to go to some of these other trees. And so maybe a sugarberry or uh, even the sable palm. 
my neighbor has that. And sure enough, I do see certain birds going into her tree. But I think a lot of my neighbors are not, uh, they're unaware of what they have going, yeah. uh, going on in their yard and what they're attracting. You, you, you heard my curiosity about your swallowtails. Do you plant fennel or something for them? Parsley? Uh, no, uh, I don't. But I do have a little by little, I, once I discover that I have a invasive plant, I do remove it and then just been the tra uh, planting little natives and then letting things grow and see how it is. I don't live in an HOA, so I kind of let certain parts of my yard go wild. And it's in these wild areas where I just see them going uh, to be honest, I don't even know what some of the plants they're going to. I haven't identified it yet, but I see them laying the eggs. So I've literally even fenced off a part of my yard, like, and it's kind of overgrown, but they always go there. And so something's in there that's attracting them. But I have uh, planted the quirky stem passion flower. Oh, and, and that really spreads. Yes. And... I never had the zebra long wings until I planted that. Exactly. Same with me. Yes. Yeah. I, I tried a lot of years to grow the uh, Passiflora incarnata, the sand hill one. Yes. It, it, it's, it's very trick, touchy. Tricky. Yes. I haven't grown that one yet. But I remember seeing some of Doug's, Doug Tallamy's programs where I think it was very inspirational where he talked about he planted it and then sometimes it took time, but eventually things would come, things would find uh, the trees or shrubs or whatever. And so I would say people, uh, my advice is to just be patient, but many of these B butterflies and moths they will find it eventually uh, hopefully uh, especially if it's like you're living kind of in a landscape desert and you're the only one I feel like a lot will gravitate towards your yard and so I've seen that happen with mine uh, which all the birds all these pollinators they just flock to my yard and I've seen that change I've lived at my house for 10 years and it's just been a slow change of planting things seeing what comes and it's really great to see the diversity growing when you're planting natives so I think that everyone uh, if they can should start uh, because it's so important for the birds well, great question, Stephanie. Um, anybody else have any besides Stephanie? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I don't see any other questions in the chat. Okay. So if you don't mind, I'm going to shift gears real quick. Uh, if you didn't mind talking a little bit about the upcoming festival, if you yeah. wanted to give a little information to our viewers. I would, I would appreciate the chance. Okay, so it's uh, Orange Audubon six-year-old festival. And it features the Lake Papa North Shore, which currently is the top eBird hotspot in Florida. 370 approximately species have been seen, which is really astounding. And we, we give out cards, business cards, and on the back we have the ecotourism definition, responsible travel to natural areas that conserves the environment, sustains the well-being of the local people, and involves interpretation and education. So that's been important to link to that definition we a lot of what we're doing to try to support the lake popka north shore is to ward off things that are called ecotourism that really are not going to be very uh they're going to be more damaging to the environment plus they're not going to help the local people so here it shows what that it's the top ebird hot spot if you go to ebird you can navigate and see this that lake popka north shore Fort DeSoto Park is next, St. Mark's, Gulf Island, Honeymoon Island, Merritt Island, Ball Point. So it's a special place. And um, it's the easiest place in Florida to see fulvous whistling ducks. I'm not sure why that's fuzzy. Um, and we have the locations on the website. The website is just northshorebirdingfestival.com. That's a new website. Um, and we're featuring the Lake Papa North Shore, this green part right here, um, this part. And 
but we're going in about a one hour radius around um, to different sites on the different field trips. No, excuse me, uh, Deborah, you still are sharing the screen from the presentation. So if you exit that, then you can reshare the website page. <laughs> oh, the website page? Oh, oh if I'm you wanted to, the North Shore. Uh, oh, um, okay, sorry. Um, let's see, share screen. And there, okay, yes, I wasn't on the, the yes, perfect. Yes, now we can see. I'm sorry. Okay, no so, um, but this is a map of the Lake Popka North Shore. And if you know the story, this all was once part of the lake. Then it was cordoned off for farming on the muck soil. And then the farmers polluted the lake. So the water management district was able to buy it out. And now it's just sitting there as a restoration area with various techniques being used. And Lake Popka has uh, considerably improved in water quality. And where we are mostly based at the festival is in the western part, the McDonald Canal area. I can go back to the map. We are based over here. This is a, the wildlife drive that many of you have had a chance to go to, some of you really love, um, but that's the eastern part. And by the way, that's open Friday, Saturday, Sunday only. And uh, you know, it's self-guiding, it's easy. Over here, there's lots of roads, but um, you can only walk in or ride your bike normally, but we have driving access during the festival. And we're based right here in this North Shore McDonald Canal Trailhead. So here's what it looks like as you approach. And this is what, where we take off for the, for the field trips um, in the early morning, most of them. And here we come, back for lunch. Uh, I think this was right the year before COVID that we're, we're a little less crowded um, now and we do box lunches to be a little safer. Um, and the McDonald Canal area has good birds right there in the swale. And I don't know why these pictures are coming up fuzzy, but um, there's some bluebirds there because they have bluebird boxes and there's some good sparrows, grasshopper sparrow, that's a, the migratory one and a uh, white crown sparrow. And a special one is the clay colored sparrow, littler than the white crowned, uh, another winter sparrow. They're right there at that McDonald Canal area. And if you were really lucky, we see a bobcat, eagle, Merlin with a little songbird, like Sam Mitchum took this picture, amazing. And we do birding by ear right there in the weedy area. And in those weeds are sparrows and painted buntings. We all get to see painted buntings. And then we go through the gate and on the gravel roads, it's all surrounded by birdie, birdie terrain. So over here to the left is swales and uh, ponds. And the black neck stilts had a good year and they may linger. Every year There's a, we find a place where uh, a group of them are, are gathering. And there's the canal, the Paca Beauclair Canal, and along it is um, some good stuff. And here is uh, our birding for millennials and others, the, the field trip that we try to get a critical mass of students in, have young leaders. So actually this year we have a, on Saturday afternoon and Sunday afternoon, birding for millennial and others. I, I, if anybody on this, program is is young um, want to check that out we'd love to have you um, and this bridge over the Beauclair Canal is a good location to find the least flycatcher and the ashlar flycatcher I see least is just one that doesn't occur here very often it's a little farther south and the ash-throated is a western bird but it's it's seen every year in the Lake Popkin um, North Shore and then from the Clay Island Trailhead, which is the far western part, uh, we go to, I'm sorry, these, I don't know what's wrong with these, um, to take sunrises over Lake Apopka in the sunrise trips. So, so we have sunrise trips four days. And tree swallows come in in the winter. That's fun to see. And two, for several years, we had Anis, uh, a southwestern bird, this move, uh, let's see. The groove bildani is the southwestern one, and the smooth bildani is a tropical one that occurs in South Florida. So uh, I hope we find them again this year. And 
let's see, I want to tell you that after Hurricane Irma broke the levee, um, there's a lot of water on the fields and it's been very good for wading birds and ducks. And the wildlife drive is busy. Um, so we, um, we do have a few trips that have permission to go on the wildlife drive during the festival this year. But normally we are concentrating on the other part because you can do the wildlife drive on your own. And let's see, you've got the Green Mountain Trailhead on the far western part. And Ferndale Preserve, is, we've got a trip going there. And we go also in this year to Orlando Wetlands Park, which is another property that Orange Audubon is very involved with when way eastern Orange County. And we go this, last year we started for the first time to go to Merritt Island because we're no longer one week before the Space Coast Birding Festival. So why, why do we have to hamper ourselves? Might as well go there too. And uh, this, this young trip leader, Jeffrey Gammon is just example of many of the young field trip leaders that we do have, including uh, Stephanie, you know, Brian Camerano. He was a faculty member of Nighthawk. He is my CLI mentee. Um, he's a leader and, and his friends from the Florida Keys Hawk Watch are leaders too. And they are very good. Great. And we just got a black rail trip set up um, in that St. John's River, St. John's uh, National Wildlife Refuge north of 50. And um, this is, and then we, the final trip is the gulls trip to see the gulls gathering on the beach. And we got well, Kiowa Spring State Park as a place of operations. We rented the youth camp for the weekend. And so we're gonna have Friday and Saturday keynotes in the youth camp dining hall this year. And I don't have the slides on it. Well, here's Rainier Mangia who's giving a um, workshop, photo workshop Saturday afternoon and Sunday morning. And uh, that one has a lot of space and I really recommend it if you wanna improve your photography. And we also have a, a lady who's a brilliant photographer, Marina Scar, giving um, critiques of your photos for a half an hour um, in the youth camp dining hall. Um, and you just have to set up, it's, it's $15 for your half hour with her. You, you give her in advance of 20 slides and she'll give you some solid tips. She's, she's experienced uh, doing this critiquing and she likes helping people. Isn't that a different idea? Awesome. <laughs> and we have Burning by Kayak, there's Brian. And, um, and then we, because we're at the park, we could have night walks. And we actually last year found woodcocks, American woodcock, it was so thrilling. Wow. And we'll be looking for those again this year. So, and we actually have a star walk um, with the director of the planetarium and Seminole State College. So it's a lot of good stuff and a lot of it, must of it's filled because it's only a little over a week away now, but there's still some good slots left. So don't be discouraged to take a look at it all, especially Saturday and Sunday, there's some good slots left, northshorebirdingfestival.com. And again, college students pay only half price. Okay. And for any college students interested, should they just go to the website and fill out the form uh, to indicate that they are a college student to get that discount? If they can um, put in their, you know, EDU, their college uh, address, uh, email address, that makes it simple. But if for some reason they can't email out from that, um, they might have to prove that later that they are by showing that address. Uh, that they are a college student. Okay. All, the website is, is pretty swift. It, it, you won't have any, you shouldn't have any trouble. And if you do, um, the email festival at orangeaudubonfl.org is all over the place. And that comes to me and I am happy to help people. Excellent. And I'll also put the website in the description for the program tonight. And Thank you so much for such a great program from the Caterpillar Connection to talking about the festival. I think it's a really fun event. People should uh, go if they can and support everything that uh, Orange Audubon is doing. So thank you, Deborah, for coming out tonight and having an amazing program. And uh, for our viewers, thank you for coming this evening. And we will see you again in January. Have a safe holiday and uh, take care.
Thanks for inviting me, Stephanie. You're welcome. Take care, Deborah. Good night.